I must have been about five years old the first time I decided to run away from home. I think I'd seen it on a movie before because I grabbed a stick and a bandana, bundled up a few of my belongings, and announced to my parents I was heading out on my own. Welcome to the Women of the Bible podcast. I'm Erin Davis, and in this season, we're rediscovering the book of Ruth. The story begins when a man named Elimelech decides to leave home. When I was a little girl and decided to run away, my parents let me go, likely knowing that I wouldn't make it past the end of the block. And God let Elimelech go deep into enemy territory. As we open our Bibles together and explore the book of Ruth for the next six weeks, we're going to see that it's really a story about how God calls all of his children home. So grab your Bible and come along on the journey with me and some of my favorite friends as we walk through Ruth, experiencing a life restored. I came to Jesus kicking and screaming. I'm fond of saying kicking and screaming obedience is still obedience. How does my work ethic show that I value work? As I was walking through some of these darkest moments, the valley may be long and it may be very dark, but God promises to be with you in the midst of it. Everything I get in this world, in this earth, is a treasure and a gift. Do not turn off the podcast at this moment. I often have to think God is not oblivious to the situation that I'm in. Welcome to the Women of the Bible podcast. Does anybody have the first day of Bible study jitters? Do you? Yeah. Do you, yes. Does that happen to you in real life? The first time you have a Bible study, I mean, this is real life, but the first time we have a new Bible study at my church, I always feel a little nervous. Yes. What's that about? I don't know. I don't know either. Well, I hope that if you're listening, you don't have butterflies in your tummy. I hope you're just eager to be with us. But we are about to jump into the book of Ruth, and I have a question to get us started. I want you to tell us your name and how long you've been walking with the Lord. We'll start with you. So my name is Portia Collins, and I have been walking with the Lord whew, since I was, honestly, since I was a little girl. I say that the Lord gripped me as a child, um, even though I probably didn't fully understand until I got in, into my late teenage, early ad, young adult years. You've with been walking the, with the Lord for decades? Decades. All right, over here. Oh your name my. and how long you've been. This is you're gonna win this question. I'm afraid. But your name and how long you've been walking with the Lord. I'm Gail Vialba, and I've been walking with the Lord since the age of five, which okay. is many decades. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm Erin Davis, and I gave my life to Jesus at 15, and I just turned 40. Mm-hmm. So somebody do the math for me. I don't right. do, do math, yeah. but uh, I've been walking with the Lord for a couple decades too. And the reason I ask that is because whether you've been walking with the Lord five minutes or five Mm -hmm. years or 50 years, we all need the Word of God at every step in that journey. I'm curious, think back to those early days. For you, it was when you were little girls. For me, it was when I was a teenager. When you first started reading the Bible, how has your study or your approach to Scripture changed over time, Gail? Hmm. When I started, I didn't love it. Mm. It was a job. It was a something to check off of my to-do list because I wanted to do this well, right. this business of being a Christian. I didn't really love it. Yeah. I didn't really understand the relationship part as well as I did as I got older. I so appreciate that honesty. I imagine that there are women right now sitting in Bible study groups. They're getting ready to do Ruth, mm-hmm. and there's a woman sitting there going, I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't I don't have the time or I don't know how to study my Bible mm-hmm. or I don't know these women or mm-hmm. I don't know how to do this. Right. And mm-hmm. so I so appreciate your honesty, but I'm glad she's there. I'm glad mm-hmm. she's listening to yeah. us. How about you, Portia? Over time, how would you say your your attitude or your approach to scripture has changed? Um, I think that um In my younger years, I had such a disjointed understanding of Scripture. Mm. It was like I didn't see this as one big, beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay. 
Extract you, a little yeah, here. Yeah, you got to yeah, like I didn't see like I hated the Old Testament, mm-hmm. didn't want to read things. <laughs> Ruth was probably one of the only stories that I wanted to read because I thought, "Oh, I got to find my Boaz." And so this is sure, a, this is a yeah, hot how to man. Absolutely. Yes, but um o- over time I have I have a more holistic understanding of God's word and mm-hmm. I see the beauty of it and um like Gail at first I didn't love reading scripture I, I felt like it was one of the things to do to check off you know a notch on my right. Debbie do good or Christian right. list um but now it is just such a joy for me it's like food mm-hmm. it's food for my soul like I can't go without eating mm-hmm. and so I can't go without just sitting and soaking in the scriptures love that I think my early days as a believer, I expected to have an emotional emotional response every time I opened right. my Bible. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to, you know, mm-hmm. open my Bible to the right. Psalms mm-hmm. and birds would start singing <laughs> up over my shoulder <laughs> and I would have some revelation. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes you do get those lightning bolts with scripture. Mm-hmm. But I think over time, I've learned to just be disciplined. And the more you know the word, right. the more you love it. I think I had those flipped. I was trying to let my love for scripture Mm -hmm. motivate us. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that as you're listening, your approach to scripture is evolving like ours is. And I think Ruth is actually an interesting case study for us to jump in with because I'm not sure it's the Ruth you think you know. Uh, You may have heard the story of Ruth. You may even read the whole thing. It's only four little chapters. Mm -hmm. So we'll get through all of it in this season of the women of the Bible. But um, I think it might not be the version we've always heard. Mm -hmm. So what is the Ruth? How have you always heard the book of Ruth described, Portia? You mentioned as that how-to guy to get your bow as. You know it. That that is what it is. I think most of the time when I, um, if I'm talking with like women in my church or community, they automatically think, oh, that's the book about, you know, how to get a man, how Mm -hmm. to do it the right Mm -hmm. way. And I'm like, uh, no. Right. <laughs> and so um, I think that is like the biggest thing, like, you know, for me and things that I want to challenge other women with is seeing, like, what are we looking at is here? Is mm-hmm. this really this fairy tale, this princess story that we think? Um, or is there more here? Like, what's the depth? Um, and I'm excited to explore that. Me this too. Season. Gail, how have you always heard the Book of Ruth framed? A love story. The ultimate mm-hmm. love story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she meets her prince, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. It's Cinderella, right? <laughs> yes, it's, it's Cinderella. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And that's way more than that. It's so much more than that. It is a love story. Mm-hmm. Um, that part's true, but that right. it's just so much more than that. Right. So I'm so glad we're going to go right. a little bit, mm-hmm. not a little bit, a lot deeper. Are there other places in Scripture that you thought you knew and over time you go, wait a minute, that's not the way I'd heard it framed or it's not the story I thought it was or it doesn't mean what I thought it had. I'll give an example. I've spent a lot of time recently studying the book of Leviticus. Yes, Leviticus. Mm -hmm. 23 describes these seven feasts. Mm -hmm. And um, man, the gospel is all over those feasts. Mm -hmm. And so that's been that light bulb for me lately. Like, oh, this is not Mm -hmm. what I thought this was. It's Mm -hmm. so much more. Mm -hmm. Can you think of an example of elsewhere in scripture where you've had that experience, Portia? Oh, honestly, all over scripture. Mm -hmm. um, Because for so long, I failed to see the gospel centeredness in every passage. And so I would take passages just like with the book of Ruth and I would make them about me, Mm -hmm. you know, like this is like my, my how to, as opposed to seeing like what God wants me to see, um, learning about him. Like, and of course the truths in scripture, um, they're meant to shape our hearts, to reshape our hearts and transform our minds. But like, it's not about you. It's not like we can just cherry pick these verses and apply what we want to, to our lives to kind of concoct or make this perfect picture. Um, It's like a, a whole thing. And so, I would say and that it's I mean, about Jesus. Yeah, and it's about That's Jesus, right? right. Yeah. And so there's so many places like I can't even think specifically, but um a, a good one would be like Jeremiah 29 and 11. Mm-hmm. Um just kind of snatching that verse out of context sometimes mm-hmm. and try to apply it to, you know, going to college or um buying a house getting or that dream what, job. yeah, or getting yeah. that dream dream job and um it's more than that. It is you know, more there's than so that. much more in those in those verses, and then even knowing, like my friends jokingly called me the weeping prophet, mm. like uh, Jeremiah, and so like if you just see the the lament and 
his burden. It's not all just rainbows and gumdrops right. Right. in that book. Yeah. So. I love that in this first session of this season, you're reminding us that scripture is not about us because I think the lens we want of you, Ruth, is I'm Ruth. Mm-hmm. And the Lord's going to give me my Boaz or he's mm-hmm. going to transform mm-hmm. my current man into a Boaz or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And this story isn't about us. So I love that you're setting us up for that. Gail, can you think of an example of scripture where you thought it was one thing and the Lord gave you eyes to see it was so much more? All the way through. Yeah. I'm presently doing the chronological Bible. Me too. And are you? Yeah. So Ezekiel, right? Yeah. Yes. We're, we're, in the, we're in the weeds a little yeah. bit. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Um, but I'm trying to see it through the lens of Jesus, yeah. mm-hmm. finding Jesus in the hard areas mm-hmm. of Scripture. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's there. Yes, yes. it is And there. it just fills me with joy every time I see it. Yes, mm-hmm. I love that. All right, let's jump into the book of Ruth. Right. Uh, we are going to start where we should start, in Ruth chapter Mm 1, 1 through 5. Portia, do you have that, and can you read it for us? Absolutely. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Mm-hmm. Did you notice how I threw you the passage with all the yes. difficult names Thanks to pronounce? Lot. You're welcome. <laughs> I got your back. Um, for this session, I would like us to focus on Elimelech. Now, mm-hmm. I know the name of this book is Ruth, but there are lots of other important characters. Mm-hmm. Well, they aren't even characters. There are lots of other important people in this story, real people mm-hmm. who really lived. And I want us to think about Elimelech in this session. So from these just five verses, what do we learn about Elimelech? Look at it again. Just holler out what you see. He left his home. And where was his home? Bethlehem. And that matters because where is Bethlehem situated? We're using Old Testament language. We kind of tend to think of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus, which it was, and that's going to matter moving forward. But in Old Testament language, where was Bethlehem situated? Judah. Judah Judah. in the Mm -hmm. promised land. Mm -hmm. So he leaves his home in the promised land. You Mm -hmm. mentioned it when life gets hard. And he heads over to where? Moab. To Moab. Mm -hmm. Let's file that little nugget in the filing cabinet of our brains and we'll come back to it. What else do we learn about Elimelech from these five verses? He dies. He dies, right? His wife is Naomi. Mm -hmm. We learn his children's name. And then we learn that he dies. And Mm -hmm. the fact that he went to Moab matters. Let's look at our Bibles to find out why. Gail, do you have Genesis 19, 36 through 37? And I'll warn you, it's a little bit of a squirmy passage, but if you could read it for us, that'd be great. Okay. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The oldest daughter had a son, and she named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger daughter also had a son, and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. Okay, so nobody wants to get assigned this passage in first grade Sunday school, right? (laughs) No. Because the father of the Moabites was born out of a relationship between a dad and a daughter. Mm -hmm. So we need that context as we're considering the fact Mm -hmm. that Elimelech fled. He didn't Mm -hmm. just flee anywhere. He fled right here to Moab. I've got another squirmy passage to help us consider when we think about the Moabites. It comes from Numbers 25, 1 through 4. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Mm -hmm. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord might turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. Whoa, 
Yeah. Uh, this is part of the backdrop of the mm -hmm. book of Ruth. And this is why I say it's not the Ruth you think you know, because um, it's very significant that Elimelech took his family in to Moab. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what happens in your insides when you read passages like that in the Old Testament? Gail? I would liken it to uh, taking your, your wife and children from a godly family camp environment mm -hmm. and moving to Las Vegas mm -hmm. where there is blatant sin. Yeah. And trying to protect everyone. Yeah, they've built that city on sin, right? right, right. And just they call decide, it Sin City. Sin City, mm -hmm. that's, that's right. right. Deciding we're going to move into that place. Mm -hmm. Portia, when you hear those descriptions of the Moabites being born out of an incestuous relationship and, and yoking themselves to foreign pagan gods mm -hmm. as the backdrop of Ruth, does that change the picture at all for you? Absolutely. Um, because it's it's really like, blatant disobedience mm -hmm. got going against what God had instructed, what they had been taught. It's like what I know about some of the books that precede Ruth, it's blatant, like we're going to do our own thing mm -hmm. here and we're going to go somewhere else. Um, God was very um, particular about saying to his people, the Israelites, you know, don't do this. Don't yoke yourself with these people. Don't be with the Canaanites. Don't be with the Moabites. Yeah, he warned and, them about the Yes, Moabites, like no, sure. no, like living there and intermingling. And so to take your family out of the, the safe land, the promised land, and to go into a land that God had already said, don't do this. It's kind of like, oh, something's bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, kinda... it's significant. And what we don't know from the text is, did Naomi have a say? We don't know. Right. Did Elimelech just say, we're going, and mm -hmm. she had to go along? Did mm -hmm. she protest? Was mm -hmm. she grieved by it? We don't know any of that. Mm -hmm. But we are going to work towards a happy ending in Ruth. And, man, happy endings are so much sweeter when you see the true darkness of the beginning mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. And the true darkness of the beginning of the story is that Elimelech took his family and fled 60 miles into enemy mm -hmm. territory. And it wasn't just a visiting neighbor. Uh, when you study the Bible, I love that you mentioned this, Portia, you connect all of those parts. If we look back at Ruth 1, it tells us that Elimelech intended to just sojourn to Moab. That's not a word we use very frequently. But what do you think that means, that he just intended to sojourn in Moab? To just travel there for a little while, mm -hmm. you know, maybe go in sit there just for a minute and come back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just wait out that famine maybe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But that's not what happened. No. The reality is he gets to Moab, his wife has children, mm -hmm. they put down roots, mm -hmm. and he dies there, and I assume mm -hmm. is buried in the land of Moab. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that famine for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, Olimelech and Naomi were from the promised land. They were children of the promised land. Mm -hmm. Uh, who's got Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 18? This is some okay. insight into what life was supposed to be like there in the promised land. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come up on you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. So we don't know, but it's possible that the famine occurring in Judah was the judgment of God. That's not a very popular idea, no. is it? But we see this in scripture. Mm -hmm. If you honor mm -hmm. the Lord, we're going to give you fruitful life in the promised land. And if you turn from the Lord, I'm going to curse shall be your kneading bowl and yeah. curse shall be your fields and mm -hmm. all of those things. Why? Why do you think the Lord says, if you don't follow me, I'm going to curse the fruit of your life or your land? Gail, you got thoughts? Some of that, I believe was natural consequences mm -hmm. of going against the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. He laid it out pretty clearly for mm -hmm. them as to how to live. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this, there will be consequences. Awesome. So I think it's a combination. I mean, I'm not taking away from the punishment aspect by sure. any means, mm -hmm. but some of it 
should have made sense to them, Mm -hmm. and it didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. So here in Deuteronomy, he's giving them instructions for how to live in the promised land. Right. Mm -hmm. And they've been enslaved, so he's Mm -hmm. they're kind of starting over. Mm -hmm. This is how you live a good and fruitful Mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, his judgment is to call us back to him, right? So that we can experience life out there without him. What it's like when we're out from under his blessings, mm-hmm. in the hopes that we would run back toward him. Yes. So I don't want to over apply this. It doesn't say right here in Ruth one, Judah was experiencing mm-hmm. a famine due to God's judgment, mm-hmm. but um, it's possible yes. that that's what was happening. And yet Elimelech makes this choice to flee the promised land, mm-hmm. to get out from under God's judgment, which I've experienced that, haven't you? When conviction oh, yes. comes, you like <laughs> want to squirm your way out of it any way you can. But I wonder what does it communicate about Elimelech's faith, that he fled the promised land when the going mm-hmm. got tough, mm-hmm. that he allowed his sons to marry Moabite that's women, right. mm-hmm. We would be reading between the lines here mm-hmm. to make that clear. We're not saying something that's right. overtly in Scripture. But do you draw any conclusions about Elimelech's heart from those factors? Portia? Oh, he was disobedient. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so hard because we never want to. We want to see all the pretty fluffiness in Scripture. Right. But, like, we don't want to wrestle with the. Uh, what it looks like when you are disobedient and the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we see in these beginning verses of of Ruth is a man who didn't make the right choice and it severely impacted not just him, but his entire family. His wife, we're going to see, is deeply impacted at a heart level by his choices. His sons, we don't know much about, except for that they married Moabite women and died. Mm -hmm. Um, But... They were also buried in the land of Moab, Mm -hmm. which is considering all we know about Mm -hmm. Moab. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're seeing a picture of disobedience here. And we do want to fast forward it and get to the wedding in Ruth chapter 4, right? (laughs) Get your Boaz. We want to get our Boaz and throw the rice. In this case, it's barley. but uh, And then move on. But we've got to sit in this a little Mm -hmm. bit to Mm -hmm. understand it. Gail, any thoughts about Elimelech's heart as we kind of extract these first few verses? Yes. By personal experience, Mm -hmm. I think when you take a step of disobedience and you think I'm going to go this far and no farther, Mm -hmm. um, the default is just to keep going down that path. And even though his his sons marrying Moabite women, Mm -hmm. um, by then, I don't know Elimelech's heart, but I just can imagine by then he was saying, whatever, Mm -hmm. I'm already here, Mm -hmm. I've already disobeyed, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. But I remember times when I've gone there in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, I did this, so I might as well do that. Mm -hmm. I'm always amazed how quickly sin progresses. Yes. We see it in Genesis. It goes from the bite of the apple to murder in one generation. Right. Mm-hmm. right. And here it goes from let's just move to Moab. Mm-hmm. I hear they have food. Right. To mm-hmm. let's let our sons marry Moabite women, mm-hmm. which is a big leap. Yeah. Um, and it happened in one generation. Right. So you know what this reminds me of in my local small group, we um often talk about head, heart, hand, Mm. and how basically sin starts with like just a thought sometimes. And I I can imagine if we were to use our imagination in looking at this text, Elimelech probably thought that he was smart and was like, okay, I'm going to leave this land where we're experiencing trouble you know this is a bright idea and we're justified as yeah. i got a wife to protect yes. i need to do whatever it takes yes and so it starts in the head and then goes to the heart and it's like okay well now we're here and i'm gonna just settle and we're gonna right. stay here and in the hand and just acting that out and mm-hmm. probably i can imagine that they probably picked up the customs of that land and like with him letting his sons marry moabite women like you're becoming exactly what God told you to stay away from. I love that progression. That is so how it happens. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see some other people in this story that have a totally different head, heart, hand Mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. I think all of our human tendency is to want to run away from the pressure of God um, and into the arms of lesser comfort. So I can't, Mm -hmm. well, I would love to paint Elimelech as the bad guy because that Mm -hmm. makes me not like Elimelech. (laughs) 
I'm so like Elimelech. Yes. I want to get out yeah. of the we pressure. Mm-hmm. So I always want us to think about the women on the other side listening right now. She's mopping the floors in her kitchen. She's got her AirPods in her ears or she's driving down the road. In your own lives or the women you know, what are the pressures that we as women and the women we know want to run away from? It doesn't have to be the conviction of God, but just the, the pressures of life. What is it that makes us want to press that pressure release valve? Well, as a wife and a mama, that is tough sometimes. Me and my husband, we have to, I call them um, come to Jesus meetings, <laughs> and we have to sit down and talk through things. And sometimes I feel like, oh, it's not fair. You know, I got to do all of this. And I feel like I'm always juggling 15 things. And it's easy to kind of start letting that resentment settle in. And God just kind of reels me back in and reminds me, look, I gave this to you. I gave, this is your portion of life. And so um, choosing to find joy in those ordinary day-to-day things um, that you're doing, you know, when your husband has left his socks in the floor for the 15th time mm-hmm. or his trousers on the foot of the bed and you're like, dude, <laughs> you know, uh, but really just um, learning to appreciate what God has given you mm-hmm. and be joyful where he has placed you even when it's hard. I think a lot of women feel that that pressure to do Mm -hmm. it all that Mm -hmm. you're mentioning that makes Mm -hmm. you want to sit down and have the talk. I Mm -hmm. call those the state of the union addresses. (laughs) You call them come to Jesus talks. It's time for a state of the union, the marital union. Um, But that pressure to like, I can't keep the house clean and the marriage good and the kids happy Mm -hmm. and the Mm -hmm. meals cooked. And that's kind of a constant pressure Mm -hmm. that I think a lot of women Mm -hmm. want to escape Mm -hmm. or struggling to do it with joy. Mm -hmm. Gail, you minister to lots of women. What are some areas where they're feeling pressure and you sense they just want to escape the pressure? There's so many ways. Um, we deal with, a, a, I deal with a lot of pastor's wives mm-hmm. and uh, you just can only imagine yeah. the difficulty of being a pastor's wife and living up to everyone's expectations. Mm-hmm. Personally, um, I think my default thinking is, and we're at a whole different, an entirely different stage of mm-hmm. life than mm-hmm. than you ladies are, and we don't have young children at home. It's just the two of us. We mm-hmm. enjoy our family, but they're grown and gone. Mm-hmm. And when we've led a pastor's retreat and we've been serving for seven days, we come home and I think, I listen to the lie. I believe the lie that says you deserve um, R&R, you can do whatever you want, watch mindless HDTV or, you know, read a book that has no feeding mm-hmm. in it for my soul. Mm-hmm. And that's a dangerous place to be mm-hmm. because the truth is, what do I really deserve? I deserve hell. Right. Mm-hmm. And everything I get in this world and this earth mm-hmm. is a treasure and a gift. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I feel... I'm in this interesting season of life where I do have small children at home, but I'm also the caregiver for two aging That's relatives. Right. Yeah. And man, the caregiving pressure oh, is real. Yes. I think I can default to some of the deserve mm-hmm. I deserve, mm-hmm. but what I most often default to is I can't. I yes. can't. Yeah. I can't. Right. And I just want a pressure release. Right. I just want to go get a sonic drink in my <laughs> car in the quiet. I just right. want mm-hmm. to sit in a movie. Mm-hmm. I just, but those things don't change no. my circumstances. No, that's right. And I don't know what Elimelech faced in Moab, but I know that it wasn't carefree. So I wonder, as we think of those things women want to escape, what are the Moabs we run to? You mentioned kind of empty sources of right. comfort. Food can be a real Moab for me. Mm-hmm. I just want to run into that pantry mm-hmm. and That's find right. some quick satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Venting with women in the same season of life right. as me. So all my closest mm-hmm. friends have young children. And when we get together, if we're not very, very careful, mm-hmm. we can just mm-hmm. gripe, 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 gripe. Right. And that's a Moab. Yes. It doesn't actually relieve any of the pressures of parenting. Mm-hmm. Can you think of some Moabs you run to or women you know run to? Portia, what comes to mind? I, exactly what you just said, um, venting and complaining. Mm-hmm. Like It's my security blanket sometimes. And I feel mm-hmm. like if I can just say what it is that I feel and let it out, then... 
I'm going to, you know, it's going to be better. But like, it's like God reeled me back in. And it's like, sometimes it's just zip it. Mm -hmm. Just be quiet, Mm -hmm. a soft answer or, you know, be gracious. And so it's, um, I guess you would say, trying to vindicate myself through my words or through expressing um, my frustrations as opposed to um, praying and seeking Mm -hmm. God. Like, I often have to think God is not oblivious to the situation that I'm in. Yeah, like, he's not right. oblivious to that. Right. And so when I think that sentence, I need to vent, I just add two words to it. Or what? Okay. Like, or what? Okay. Yeah. What is going to happen if I don't? Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. any woman has ever spontaneously comb- combusted, to my knowledge, <laughs> um, <laughs> from not getting it out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. But I do face that temptation. I'm feeling pressure over here. I'm just going to run over here and spew it, and then I'll mm-hmm. feel better. Usually I don't because then I usually have a lot of repenting to do. Yes. And venting is just another word for complaining it usually. Is. Yes. yes. It is. Yeah. You're right. You're right. So um, I think there is, We, if we wanted to apply ourselves here at this point in the story, we could ask ourselves, when I'm feeling that pressure, Do I run into Moab's or do I turn to God instead? I'd love for us together turn to Psalm 55. Uh, And if you are listening with us and you're not cruising down the highway, I hope you have your Bible handy and you can turn to Psalm 55 with us. And we'll see David, who wrote Psalm 55, um, kind of go through this progression a little bit. Where at the beginning, he's feeling some pressure. Mm-hmm. And then there's a turning point where he chooses not to mm-hmm. run into a Moab, so to speak, but mm-hmm. to turn to the place that can really relieve pressure. Gail, can you just read us um, verses 1 through 8? Okay. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy at the stairs of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. So David goes on like that for a little bit. And you can always tell when you're reading David Mm because this is how he talks. Like, the enemies are going to get me. (laughs) Everybody's surrounding me. And don't you love that? That he acknowledges Mm -hmm. the pressure Mm -hmm. that he's under. Gail, you and I were just Mm -hmm. talking a little bit about sometimes when we're in the hard, Mm -hmm. we -hmm. we need to say the hard. Mm -hmm. We can absolutely trust the Lord and still say the hard. Mm -hmm. And David is such a great example Mm -hmm. for that. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't flee to Moab, spiritually speaking. Right. Portia, right. can you pick it up at 16? I love to hear you read scripture, Portia. <laughs> so can you give us 16 through 20, through the end of Psalm 55? Okay. Perfect. But I call to God. Okay, I got to pause you right there. But I call to God. Mm-hmm. That's so important. If you're writing your Bible, girl, mm-hmm. just go ahead mm-hmm. and circle that. Yes. Let's, let's use our imaginations and imagine Elimelech in the land of famine. Mm-hmm. but he called to God. God it would right. have been a very different story. Yes. I'm sorry yes. I interrupted you. That's Pick it right up there at 16. All right. But I called to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, He who is enthroned from from of old because they do not change and do not fear God. My companion stretched out his hand against his friends. He violated his covenant. His speech was smooth as butter, yet war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. He ends the psalm like with a little fortitude, right? right. At the beginning, it's like, 
everything yeah, is yeah. terrible. And mm-hmm. it was. I'm sure he was mm-hmm. facing real enemy mm-hmm. armies. Mm-hmm. But then he gets to this turning point. Mm-hmm. He says, but I'm going to trust in you. Yes. And then he ends with some fortitude, some mm-hmm. strength mm-hmm. Right. given to him by the character of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And so as we wrap up this first session of Ruth, I think that's the application for me. And the application I would give women is to, to, to sit in the challenges a little bit. Mm-hmm. Sit in this tension that we're in here mm-hmm. in Ruth 1. Mm-hmm. Don't fast forward to the wedding. Right. Mm-hmm. Sit in the challenge of opening your Bibles. That mm-hmm. can be tough. Mm-hmm. Sit in the uncomfortable parts of the story. And there's mm-hmm. gonna we've been in some. We're going to read some more uncomfortable mm-hmm. parts of the story. Sit in your own commitment mm-hmm. to attend or lead a Bible study. Mm-hmm. I love the Bible. I love Bible study. And there's still a part of me that kind of wants to... Mm-hmm wiggle out of that Mm -hmm. commitment and I need to kind of sit in it. Uh, This is not the book of Ruth you thought Mm -hmm. you knew, but Mm -hmm. it is so, Mm -hmm. so, so much more. So we're glad Mm -hmm. you're with us on the journey. Thanks, friends. Thanks for watching this episode of the Women of the Bible podcast. Be sure to subscribe and be the first to watch new content from Revive Our Hearts, like more podcasts, teaching videos, and testimonies. Come back next week for another episode of Ruth, Experiencing a Life Restored.